660, although the words will be on the screen, and for folks at home, the words will appear on your screen as well. We're going to sing two verses of God is Here. If you're able, will you stand and join us as we sing? Before you're seated, I invite you to turn and uh, greet somebody around you and welcome them to worship this morning. As we have each week during Lent, we are more intentional about pausing to take time to confess our sins. And we're going to do that this morning using the uh, responsive confession uh, that will be printed on the screen. And I invite you to uh, join with me as we go through and uh, confess our sins. Forgiving God, though I don't like to admit it, I am a sinner, much like Barabbas a rebel and a wretch, born dead in transgressions and sins, lost and without hope, doomed to perish, blinded by the gods of this age. My finest deeds are still soiled with sin, and all my righteous acts are like unclean rags. I am Barabbas. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Friends, hear the good news. Jesus walked to places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death for you. Jesus was determined to go to Gethsemane, Gethsemane and Golgotha for you. And that's why Jesus forgives you completely and loves you eternally. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you guide. Will you join your heart with mine in prayer? O blessed God, you who caused all things to exist and give us all things to enjoy and to use well in your service, 
be present in our worship this day. And grant that we may hear you and learn from you, that we may be strengthened in our faith and bring praise and glory to your name. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our brother and our savior. Amen. All right, young people, come on down. We have a children's moment with Ashley for you this morning. And as I say each week, if you young people are watching from home, get up close to the screen so you can hear and see just what Ashley has to offer you today. Good morning. All right. Since last week's boy bands weren't that relevant, we're going to go even further back to the 1800s. How does that sound? All right, so um, a long time ago in the 1800s, um, actually this man was born in the 1830s, so almost 190 years ago, uh, a man was born in England and his name was Charles Spurgeon. He was a longtime preacher long ago in, in, in England and in Europe. Um, and sometimes people call him the prince among preachers. Uh, he, was, he, was, um, he was a really famous preacher back then. Um, and he died almost a hundred years ago, but sometimes people still read his sermons. And I was, I was doing some research about him, and according to one story that I read, Spurgeon uh, and his wife owned chickens, and they would sell their eggs that the chickens laid, right? I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of eggs out and about, um, because it is Easter season. And they refused to give the eggs away. Uh, even the close relatives were expected to pay for the eggs when they got them from the Spurgeons, right? So everybody had to pay for eggs, no matter what. Um, and as a result, some people thought that the Spurgeons were really selfish and really greedy. Um, like, why do you need us to pay for all of these eggs that you get? And they accepted the criticism without defending themselves. And only after um, Mr. Spurgeon's wife died was the full story revealed. Um, they never spent one penny of that egg money on themselves. Every penny um, that they made from the sale of their eggs went to support two elderly women in the church. And even though he never mentioned it from the pulpit, um, that story is considered one of the greatest sermons he's ever preached. The story reminds us, um, reminds me at least, of a poem that's entitled Sermons That We See. And part of it goes like this. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell me the way. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds, for some see action, for some see good put in action is what everybody needs. So I'd rather see uh, a sermon than hear one any day. Um, is similar to the Bible story that we talked about upstairs last week, right? Uh, remember, we talked about Mary, and she washed his hair with the, with the perfume, and everybody said, hold on, Mary, right? So he was, he was home. He was visiting the home of Mary and Martha, um, and as they sat visiting with Jesus, she took that bottle of fancy perfume. How much did it cost? Anybody remember? Nobody remembers? Ah, oh, geez. You weren't here that week. That's all good. Uh, but they were. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it cost them a year's wages, remember? So they had to work a full year in order to, to, to buy that perfume. Um, it was her most prized possession, the best she had to give. And so she showed her love by her actions, right? She, she poured her most prized possessions at the feet uh, of Jesus. And you'd think that the others would be impressed that Mary was, was doing this, but that was not the case. She was criticized. Uh, one of them who criticized him, his name was Judas, right? And he said, we could have sold this perfume for a year's wages and given the money to the poor. But the truth is, Judas didn't really care about the poor. The Bible says um, that as the keeper of the money bag, he often helped himself to that money for his own personal use, right? So two people, Judas and Mary, one talked about helping the poor while the other showed us the importance of giving our best for Jesus. So I don't know about you, but we'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. So now let's pray. Dear God, help us to demonstrate our love for you, not in words, but in our actions. Help us to be the sermon that other people can see. In your name we pray, amen. 
Before you kids go, I just want to congratulate you on how well you're doing on your mission project for the Sunday School of collecting supplies for pets. And, uh, and there's a table out there, and it's growing each week. You're doing a great job, kids. Keep it up. Two weeks to go in Lent. And we'll be back for communion. All right, you'll be back for communion. Good. We'll see you in just a little bit. All right, we're going uh, to listen now as Joey reads for us this morning's scripture readings. The first scripture reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The next scripture reading is from Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 23. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, said the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing two verses of that great old hymn, Jesus, the very thought of thee. join your heart with mine in a word of prayer. Well, God, this morning I pray that the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you. And if you would use the 
words of this foolish servant to, to bring some clarity to your holy word, we would all be much appreciative. Open our hearts so that we might hear what you have for us today. Amen. So friends, what do you think is the uh, most famous trial of the last hundred years? I started thinking about that this week and I, I came up with this list. It might have been the, the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. Not too many of us were around for that. But after that trial, our nation was allowed to teach evolution in public schools. Or maybe it was the Nuremberg Trials where the leaders of Hitler's Nazi Germany confessed their World War II atrocities. Maybe it was the O.J. Simpson trial, remember that one with that famous black glove? Or maybe the Timothy McVeigh trial. McVeigh, you might remember, was tried for killing 168 people in Oklahoma City in 1995, or, or maybe you're thinking about the Unabomber trial, or the Saddam Hussein trial, or the Martha Stewart trial. What are the most important words in any trial? I have it down to three, my friends. They are the words innocent, guilty, and free. Every trial, you know, hinges on those three words, innocent, guilty, or free. So I want to take a minute to look at those words and to try and understand the most famous trial ever, one for all the ages. And that trial takes place in Pilate's Judgment Hall. The accused is Jesus, and the accusers are the Jewish leaders. The judge is Pontius Pilate, innocent, guilty, free. Innocent, well that's pretty easy. The innocent one in that trial is Jesus. For Pilate knew, the scripture said, that it was out of envy that the Jewish leaders had delivered Jesus up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered much because of him in a dream. Now six times in Matthew's passion narrative, he refers to Pontius Pilate as the governor. And as Judea's governor, Pilate is sitting on the judgment seat. That's because Pilate has the power of imperium. Now, if you're up on your Latin, you know that imperium means the person who decides a formal death penalty cases. In Judea, it is Pilate alone who has the power of imperium. You live or you die, according to Pilate. Jesus, though, is innocent. And even though Pilate doesn't completely understand it, well, Pilate's wife understands it. Now, I know you ladies are sitting there going, ha, even back then we women were smarter than you men. You would be right. Pilate's wife knows Jesus is innocent. And the rest of the New Testament continues to tell us that and a whole lot further. The New Testament, in fact, says that Jesus is absolutely and perfectly innocent. For example, if we read in Hebrews 4, we read that Jesus was without sin. Jesus could have broken bread with the devil out there in the wilderness. He could have broken ranks with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane when the going got really tough. But he didn't. Jesus was perfect. Always honest in the midst of lies, relentlessly kind in a world of hatred and self-centeredness, heavenly focused in spite of countless distractions going on around him. When it came to sin, Jesus never did it. Innocent. 
That's Jesus. The second word is guilty. Guilty? Well, friends, that's our friend Barabbas. Scripture says, and they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Barabbas was the Jewish version of Robin Hood. He took money from the rich Romans and gave it to the poor Jews. That made Barabbas a kind of a Jewish superstar. But Barabbas was also a famous insurrectionist. And insurrectionists were anti-Roman fighters who belonged to a political group called the Zealots. And Zealots had only one thing on their agenda. It was to get the Roman leaders out of Judea. Zealots were ready to do anything to make that happen, even slit throats. You see, friends, Barabbas wasn't just a petty thief or a second-hand scoundrel, because Rome would never take the time to condemn somebody to crucifixion like that. They would commend to crucifixion an execute a notorious insurrectionist, a first-class killer. That was Barabbas. He was a heartless, brutal criminal. He had anger in his heart and he had blood on his hands. But they knew that Barabbas would be crucified by noon. He'd be dead by sundown. His only future looked to be a hammer and three nails and the god-awful death of hanging on a cross. Guilty, that's Barabbas. Innocent, that's Jesus. But you know, guilty is not only Barabbas, it's us. Guilty. You see, Scripture says that every one of us is born dead in transgressions and sins. Luke says that we are lost. What's that word to the old hymn? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We are blinded by the image of the God of this age, said 2 Corinthians. We are unclean rags, according to Isaiah. Yeah, you can just call us Barabbas. And Paul puts it this way in Romans 7. What a wretched man I am. Now, notice he did not say, I was a wretch. No, he says, I am a wretch. Paul uses the present tense verb right now, today, as a believer. Truth be told, friends, I am still a wretch. The Bible calls it sin. Sin isn't some regrettable lapse or an occasional stumble. Sin stages a coup against God's will. Sin storms the castle. Sin lays claim to God's sovereign throne, and sin defiles God's universal authority. Sin says, get out, God. I'm in charge here. You know, it's easy in the church, I think, to want to live in peace with all people. But it's harder somehow to act on that when, when you don't get that promotion at work that you wanted because you didn't have the right connections. It's easy in the church to want to help the poor, but it's hard to do when you walk into the store and you see that flat screen TV set on sale. Besides, you work so hard for your money. It's easy in church to say one thing and then go out in the world and do the exact opposite. That's why the prophet Isaiah says we are all like sheep. And we have gone astray, and each one of us has turned to our own way. But you know what? I don't like to confess that. In fact, I would just as soon avoid that. I'm Barabbas.
I'm a prisoner to my past, my low road choices, and my high-minded pride. God has declared me guilty. And Romans 6 remind us that the, the wages of sin is death. Innocent? That's Jesus. Guilty? That's Barabbas. And guilty? That's me. But that third word, free, comes to play in a trial too. And realistically in this story, free is also Barabbas. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to, to ask for Barabbas and to destroy Jesus. And the governor said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. The word persuaded in that text, in doing a word search this week, tells me that it is better translated into the past perfect tense, had persuaded. You see, that's the difference. The Jewish leaders had all of their ducks in a row long before that early morning trial ever started. Had persuaded. That crowd that was there at that trial was much different than the crowd on Palm Sunday. On Palm Sunday, the crowd was full of Galileans. The crowd on Good Friday was full of Judeans. Up at 6 o'clock in the morning, probably, with the intent of getting Barabbas off the hook. And I can almost hear it now. The Roman guard with the key. He unlocks the prison door swings it open that day and shouts, Barabbas, you're free. They chose you to go free. And Barabbas stumbles out into the light of the day. His shackles are gone. His crimes are pardoned. He's free. Free, that's Barabbas. And free, that's us as well. Because Jesus endured not just the Roman nails and the mockery and the spear, but Jesus endured the gears of God's grinding justice. You see, friends, God does not overlook sin. God does not sit up in heaven and say, oh, it's no big deal. God is holy and righteous and perfect, and God cannot overlook sin. God must punish sin. And that's why God placed all of our sin on Jesus. That's why Scripture says, Christ substituted himself for the world. Christ substituted himself for the world. But if you really want to change that phrase, you just say it this way. Christ substituted himself for me. For me, for my sins, and God knows there's many of them, but because Christ substituted himself for me, we are free. I am free. Just think about it. The outcome of the most famous trial means that the, saber, the, the Savior's liberating power sets us free from the condemnation of our own sin, free from the past, free from every worry about the future. Innocent, guilty, and free. Those are the most important words in any trial. What would you say to the most life-changing of the three? Which one would you pick, innocent, guilty, or free? Well, I think it's pretty easy. I think it's free. Because, friends, if the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. That's us, just like Barabbas, by faith, forevermore, free. Amen. We're going to listen now to a piece of music that the choir has prepared for us.
just a slide for the choir. Yeah. We're going to pause now and receive this morning's offerings of gifts and tithes. And we are so blessed here at Emmanuel with so many people who support the work of this great church. And we thank you for all of those gifts. We thank the folks who are at home for, uh, for uh, being a part of our ministry, supporting the work that we do here. And uh, with grateful hearts, we'll pause now and receive this morning's offerings of gifts and tithes.
Let's stand and sing the words to Andre Crouch's My Tribute as we bring our gifts to God. God, it is to your glory that we bring these gifts, gifts that you gave us in the first place. And we return to you a portion of all those gifts. We ask you to bless them and to bless us who gave them, so that through these gifts and through our service we might more fully become the church you call us to be. And we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to move to a time of prayer. I invite you to be seated and we're going to sing through uh, People Need the Lord, one of the praise choruses from our Faith We Sing book, and that'll move us into a time of prayer together. God, we do give you thanks for all of the gifts that you give us, for daily food and for health, for each breath that we take, for the freedom to choose, for the gifts of your word and your power and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider all that you are and how you have entrusted so much to us. May we always be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you call us to live. Help us, O oh God, as followers of Jesus, to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think are worthy only of hate, take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. We pray, O oh God, for the church here today, that it might be an encouragement to our members to discover and to develop and to use their gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray today for those whose names are on our hearts, for Dave and Bev, for Patty and Fred, for Dick, for those who are grieving, for those who are ill in body or in spirit, for those who are oppressed and heavy laden, for those who are sick or in despair. Lord, hear the prayers that your faithful people offer you now.
future. People of Ukraine, Minister, O oh God, by your spirit and by us to all those for whom we have prayed and help us to walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We will be celebrating the sacrament of Holy Communion this morning and when the time comes I will invite you to come forward and as we did on uh, Ash Wednesday, we're going to offer two different ways to receive communion this morning. If you come down this side of the aisle, you will find the, uh, the self-contained communion kits that we have been using for the last uh, couple of years uh, on, a, on a stool right there at the front of the aisle. And uh, you're invited to take one of those and take it back to your seat and uh, receive your communion there. If you come down this side of the aisle, you will find me offering you a piece of bread and Joey offering you a cup of poured juice, and you can receive communion that way. All of the bread at that station is gluten-free, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so if you want to receive communion in what we used to call the old way, you want to work your way to the right. If you want to receive communion by the communion kits, you want to work your way to the left. It doesn't matter what side you're seated on. I have great faith you will end up back in your right seat when we have done the communion meal together. And so today it is right to give our thanks and our praise to God. Because God alone provides for the needs of God's people with a generosity beyond our wildest comprehension. In the first of your mighty acts, O God, you created the world. You filled it with good things. When you led your people out of slavery, you heard their cries in the desert, and you gave them food from heaven so that they might eat and give thanks to you. And so, too, you feed us through your child Jesus, the bread of heaven, who came to nourish us and strengthen us in the faith. Though he was killed, you raised him to life, O God, and now he gives himself with scandalous extravagance to all of those who respond to his call, the early comers and the late comers alike. So now for us, through your gracious gift of faith, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Blessed indeed is the one who came in your name, O Lord. On account of him, we set before you this table this day, and we remember his words and actions on the night that he was betrayed to his death. We recall how on that night he took bread. He gave thanks to you even as we now give thanks to you, O God, and then he broke that bread, and he passed it to his friends, and he told them, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And we recall, too, how after supper he took the cup and he gave thanks to you, even as we now give thanks to you, and said to his disciples, take and drink, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. O oh God, we pray that in your goodness and your mercy, by your Holy Spirit, you might descend upon all of us here and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and making them to be for us the bread of life, the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share in this sacred mystery of your presence may become as one, united in prayer and praise and service in his name, as we pray together the prayer that he taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 
Amen. So at the invitation of the ushers, I'll ask you to come and pick which side of the aisle you uh, want to use. Uh, Joey and I will be wearing gloves and uh, we will be wearing masks. I'm sure you've seen the news about our county compared with other counties. Um, we're going to err on the side of caution today. There's argument about how the numbers are getting compiled and I don't even want to get into it. I'm going to wear a mask. I'm going to wear gloves. Joey's going to do the same thing. Come and receive the gifts. I want to remind you always that our table is an open communion table. You do not need to be a member of this church or even a member of any church. If you perceive that Jesus is calling you to this table, I hope you come. And there you will find the meal that Jesus offered for all of us. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Loving God, we, we praise you for giving us the bread that comes from heaven, Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for how we have received him here in this place. Help us now to go forth out into the world to share him and to share his life-changing love and power with all. And we ask this today in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some announcements we want to lift up for you today. Um, we had a, a, a wonderful craft and uh, arts and crafts fair. Betty might want to tell us about it. I'll bring this over to you because your feet are probably killing you after running around here for the last three, four days. There you go. I told you your feet were killing you, didn't I? Go right ahead. <coughs> yep. Okay. Um, as everybody knows, we had the craft show um, for two days, Friday and Saturday, and it was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Is this on? Put the mic next to you. Go ahead. I'll hold this okay. one here. Oh, there you go. I'm, go ahead. I'm pretty loud, huh? I know. Okay. Well, the craft show that we had was absolutely fantastic. We had a full house. We had... 64 crafters and our crafters were happy we were happy um, and we had Barb's Bistro back thanks to Barb and Denise and their awesome crew um, I can't thank you enough everybody raved about the food and that mac and cheese was back in town <laughs> um, Denise and Shelly were so good to get all the signs out um, for me so Mike and I could go away for a couple of days and then come back because he had to plow. <laughs> um, and the men, without the men and Shelly and Julie, um, we wouldn't have had the setup that we did. And each year they get it set up even quicker than the year before. Um, we had um, our food pantry, um, which was fantastic. Dorothy Pooh, um, is our crafter that gives back 70% of what she makes, and we got $65. We had um, a raffle, more or less, with our crafters donating, donating an item. Anyone who brought in a non-perishable food item or a monetary donation got their name put in for a drawing for one of their um, beautiful crafts. And we pulled in... Um, $192 from that. So for the food pantry, we had $257. That's great. And lots of food. And lots of food. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, we, we had my grocery cart full of food. It was overflowing. Um, let me see. From the table sales, um, which was $40 for each person that, that had a table, we pulled in um, $2,360. And then from um, Barb's Bistro, um, after their expenses, $550.03. So we had a total of $2,910.03. And thank you, thank you for everyone who helped and who was here and shopped and told people about the craft show. This was awesome. And our next one's going to be in October. So we're looking forward to another great show. Great. Thank you, Betty. And uh, we need to thank Betty as well for all of her hard work to pull that together and make that happen. A, a great job done by all. I've been asked to remind you that there are some goodies left over from Barb's Bistro. Unfortunately, macaroni and cheese is not among them, but there are other goodies and they are available right outside the kitchen. When you leave today, if you need a pie to take home or something, stop out there and, uh, and see one of the folks and they'll be glad to help you out. Phyllis will be taking orders for Easter flowers outside. Uh, Easter is two weeks from today, my friends. That means that Holy Week starts next Sunday. A brief rundown of Holy Week. We will worship on Palm Sunday next week at 8.30 and 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. On uh, Thursday night, the 14th of uh, April, that will be Monday, Thursday, we'll gather here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock 
for uh, a remembrance of the Last Supper and to celebrate communion together on Monday Thursday. Good Friday, there is not a formal worship service here in the sanctuary, but the sanctuary will be open for private meditation between 12 and 3 on Good Friday afternoon. That's the 15th of April. And Easter resurrection celebration uh, two weeks from today, the 17th of April at 8.30 and 10 o'clock. It'll be a great day. We hope that some of the folks who have been watching from home all these months might uh, journey back out and join us here in person in the sanctuary for our resurrection day celebration. I also want to uh, thank you very much for all of your contributions to the brown bag lunch program being done by First United Methodist Church down in the village of Camillus. This week's uh, perishable or non-perishable item was Oreo cookies and there's a whole bunch of them out there. That's great on the table. And next Sunday the non-perishable food item is individual servings of applesauce. They go in the lunch bags that, uh, that uh, the folks at first provide to uh, young people in the community in the summertime. So if you're out in the grocery store this week and you come across a case of those individually served uh, applesauce, uh, grab a case and bring it in and put it on the table and uh, the kids will uh, enjoy it this summer. Are there any other announcements? Choir, Thursday, 6.30 for an hour. 6.30 for an hour on Thursday. Hi, Judy. We start knitting tomorrow. Knit and stitch starts tomorrow. All right, good. The problems of the world need solving and they need to get back here again to do that. Yes. Garage sale. Garage sale. All right, for folks at home, the garage sale is April 28th, 29th, and 30th, and Shelly has flyers. Uh, for information. Lori's waving at me because we're going to offer a nursery on Easter Sunday morning at the 10 o'clock service. So if you have friends with little kids and you want to bring them along, Lori will be in the nursery with lots of fun things to do for the little ones on Easter morning at our 10 o'clock worship service. All right, let us uh, let me offer you a word of benediction today and then we'll sing our closing song because the ushers have already got the back doors open. That's my sign. Wrap it up, Pastor. Today I want to uh, encourage you to think about those three words that you heard, innocent, guilty, and free. And celebrate the fact, friends, that in Jesus we are free indeed. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forever. Amen. We're going to sing our closing song, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Will you stand and join us as we sing? thanks to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.